We are now partaking of the Holy Communion this morning. And before we partake of the Holy Communion, let us make a preparation of the emblems at our respective homes, the bread, and also the cup, even as we prepare our hearts as we look to the Lord. Let us now, each and every one of us, bow our heads as we commit this time to the Lord. Father, we come to you this Sunday morning, looking unto our Lord Jesus Christ, in remembrance of him on the cross, and in expectation of his second coming, that this day we partake of the Holy Communion knowing that the bread represents the body of Christ. And the cup that we are to partake is an emblem of his blood in the new covenant. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. Verse 23, and I read, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. Verse 24, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26. For whenever you eat this bread, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us partake of the bread. And let us now partake of the cup. Let us bow our heads as we pray to the Lord. Father, we thank you for the blood of Christ that indeed cleanses of all us of all sin. And today, even as we remember Jesus, our Lord and our Savior on the cross of Calvary, there is this expectation in each and every one of us as the children of God that indeed our Lord will come again for each and every one of us in the fulfillment of his promise of the second coming. And today we pray, O Father, even as we are brought into remembrance of our Lord and our Saviour, that in the presence of God, each and every one of us shall manifest a fresh, manifest power of God in our lives. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. is 
also happening every Saturday. Join them from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. All youths do remember to join in. Weekly Bible study sessions on Christian maturity is also on every Sunday. A 45-minute fruitful session from 10 a.m. to 10:45 a.m. Last but not least, Children's Church is on every Sunday as well. Zoom with them from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. and do feel free to stay on for the Arts and Crafts session as well. To receive your private Zoom or YouTube link, do contact your CG leader or Pastor Rester. That's all for this week. Good morning, Topians. Today, we are continuing in our series, Beauty for Ashes, based on the book of Ruth. Chapter 1 begins on a dismal note, but praise the Lord, it ended on a hopeful note with the mention that the famine was over. And in chapter 2, we saw how hope enables us to endure, to persevere, and to make it through tough, tough times. Just believing that there is a better tomorrow waiting for us just round the corner helps us make it through today. Naomi's hope burns even brighter at the end of chapter 2 when she realizes that now they have a Redeemer who holds the solution to all their problems. Today, we are going to see faith arising from hope in Naomi's life. But first, let us pray. Father, we ask for your hand upon us, that Lord, as we look into your word, may you cause faith to arise, that Lord Jesus, we continue to trust you for everything in our life, and that Lord, you will be with us through our ups and downs, and the good and the bad, that in all things, we serve a good and faithful God. So be with us, in Jesus' name we pray, Amen. Now, faith and hope are related concepts in the Bible. Hebrews 11.1, 11, 1, a very familiar verse. In the NIV, it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. In the NKJV, it's stated that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I went into um, biblehub.com and out of 28 listings of Hebrews 11, 1, only one, only one translation does not have the word hope in its uh, meaning for faith. And it is found in God's word translation where things we expect is used in place of hope. You see, wherever hope is present, faith is present as well. And chapter 2 ended on a hopeful note telling us that Ruth stayed close to the servant girls of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Now, the barley and wheat harvest together last about six to seven weeks. And Naomi is aware that once harvest is over, Ruth and her, they would both lose their source of support and a chance of being redeemed by Boaz. Based on Ruth's description of how Boaz had responded to her in grace, Naomi then must be hoping that Boaz would make the first move to redeem them. But he didn't. And now with harvest coming to an end, chapter 3 opens with Naomi making strategic plans to arrange for a marriage between Ruth and Boaz. Chapter 3 verse 1 says, one day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? Is not Boaz, with whose seven girls you have been a kinsman of ours? Tonight, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. Naomi had been hopeful, but now we see her being so sure of that which she hoped for that she decided to act on it. 
So the first thing we must understand is that faith shows itself in action. Faith shows itself in action. In contrast to her passive role at the opening of chapter 2, Naomi is now the initiator of action. Faith is proactive. It generates an active response because what we believe is true. As evidence of the importance of faith in action, James gives us two uh, examples. The first is Abraham and the second is Rahab. In Abraham's case, Abraham demonstrated faith by his willingness to offer his only son, Isaac, as a sacrifice in obedience to God's word. Rahab, on the other hand, demonstrated faith when she risked her own life to harbor the spies, believing that they were there in God's service. Faith must be followed with actions that are consistent with what is believed. For example, if you are praying for rain, bringing along an umbrella will show that you, are, you have faith in what you are doing. Okay? Faith is the ability to believe, but that ability must be used and acted upon for faith to come alive and work. James tells us that faith without corresponding actions is lifeless and dead. James 2.17 tells us, So it is with faith. If it is alone and includes no actions, then it is dead. A better word for dead in the verse above might be dormant, like a dormant volcano is just there, it doesn't do anything. Or another word would be unproductive or inoperative. Actions are needed to bring faith to life. And corresponding actions are needed to show that there is faith in what we believe. Look at Jesus, for example. When he saw the man who was paralyzed, he said, I say to you, a paralyzed man, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And immediately that paralyzed man, he rose up, he took up what he had been lying on and he departed to his own house, glorifying God. And when Jesus met this man with a withered hand, Jesus said, stretch out your hand. And he stretched out his hand by faith. You know, a withered hand that cannot go far, it, he stretched it out. And it was restored as whole as the other. And of course, Peter received faith to walk on water when he heard Jesus say, come. But unless and until he stepped out of the boat, he did not start walking on water. Actions will unlock the power resident in faith. Faith does not mean that you sit back and let God take care of things. Think about it. After 40 years in the wilderness, the children of Israel are now right at the banks of the Jordan River. Over on the other side is the Promised Land. What is before them? Before them is a raging, turbulent river. But it wasn't the river that was obstructing them, that was stopping them from crossing. It was their lack of faith. Until they had the faith to step into the turbulent waters, they could not cross over. But the minute they did that, the waters separated and the people walked into the promised land on dry ground. So it is with our lives. Obstacles will separate us from God's richest blessings. To simply have faith that God will provide a way doesn't always make a way. To stand by until God makes a way obvious may cause us to delay His blessings. And so it takes both faith and action on our part to experience God's best. Now, Naomi decided to act on her faith and so she hatched a dangerous and risky plan that involves Ruth cleaning herself up, going to the community trashing floor, lying at uh, Boaz's feet ask, and asking to be covered by his garment. Now things could have turned out very badly for Ruth. And in this case, faith shows itself in courage. Faith shows itself in courage. Now when we talk about this part concerning the trashing floor, we have to first address the elephant in the room. 
Uh, there are only uh, a very small amount of source materials that deal with the peculiar events that happen at the threshing floor. First, we must understand this record is in the Word of God and we can be sure that whatever in the Word of God is truth and is genuine. Second thing we must remember is we are separated from that situation by time and culture. You know what happened in, in the book of Ruth happened uh, approximately 1,200 years BC which makes it about 3,000, more than 3,000 years uh, away from us. And the culture is different. Let us not forget that they are living in the days of the judges when they had no king and everyone did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. So whatever seemed right might not be the right thing at all. And lastly, we must remember that not everything in the Bible that is, that, that is found in the Bible not everything that is described in the Bible is prescribed in the Bible. Like, for example, we read that um, Judas went out and he hanged himself. That's a description. But does that mean we also go out and hang ourselves? No, it is not prescribed. So when we read the narrative portions of the Bible, we have to be very careful that what is described is not necessarily prescribed. But what we do know is that the threshing floor is normally located on a high hill. It is to catch any wind that is blowing. And after all the, the harvesting, there will be a big feast to celebrate the end of the harvest, and especially when the threshing is done. And after the feast is over, the men will uh, sleep around the grain to protect the grain. Remember, it's the days of judges. They would have people, uh, their enemies coming to rob them. So they have to protect the grain. Ruth had to go alone at night to the threshing floor, a place where women should not be. She has to note carefully where Boaz was sleeping. Don't go and find the wrong man, all right? He has to approach him under the cover of darkness, uncover his feet and lay down. Just talking about it tells you how dangerous, how risky a uh, uh, thing it is to do. And courage is really needed. Some commentators suggest that Ruth did uh, something that is immoral. But nothing in the passage su supports this. First of all, we know that Naomi cares for Ruth. And apparently Naomi had complete confidence in the integrity of Boaz. Secondly, we know that Boaz is a man of honour and thus could be trusted to act responsibly. And thirdly, Ruth was recognised by everyone as a woman of noble character. The same label that is given to the Proverbs 31 woman. Now probably the scene took place in the dark so that Boaz had the opportunity to reject the proposal without causing a scandal in the town. And it also gives Boaz the, the sense of security, knowing that he's not being trapped. There is no element of entrapment there, where he's being put in a difficult position and he has no choice to but to say yes. And the story continues, that Boaz finished eating and drinking, he was in good spirits, he was very happy, he had a good harvest, and he went down to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. And Ruth did what Naomi told her to do. She approached quietly, she uncovered his feet, and she lay down. And in the middle of the night, something startled the man. Maybe a bad dream? And then he turned, and he discovered a woman lying at his feet. To lie down at someone's feet is to take the position of a servant, waiting for the command of the master. And so, discovering a woman at his feet Boaz asked, who are you? Remember, it's very dark, they had no street lights, and they were out in the, in the fields, and Boaz had to ascertain, who is this person? And Ruth said, I am your servant Ruth. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. Identifying herself as a maidservant, Ruth acts toward Boaz 
in humility without any reference to entitlement. She did not come in and say, hey, you are my kinsman redeemer. Aren't you supposed to do something about uh, our situation? No, she comes with humility. And she asks Boaz to take action using a very expressive metaphor. She said, spread the corner of your garment over me. This is a request for marriage. Since Near Eastern custom allowed for this type of symbolism to speak of a marriage covenant relationship. And Ruth's choice of words is also a play on Boaz's blessing upon her in chapter 2 verse 12. In chapter 2 verse 12, Boaz said, May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. The wings of Yahweh became a place of provision, protection, and rest for Ruth. The word for wing is kanaf, which can also mean the edge of a garment or covering. So what uh, Ruth was saying is actually spread the corner of your garment or spread your wings over me since you are a kinsman redeemer. Ruth is creating a word picture for Boaz, a word picture that shows Boaz covering her with his garment very much like a mother bird would cover her young with her wing. Ruth was asking Boaz to fulfill the words of blessing that he, he bestowed upon her. She's saying, hey, you prayed for me now. You will be the answer to that prayer. In his book, Sweet and Bitter Providence, John Piper points out that the only other place in scripture where you see this phrase, spread your wings or garment over me, is an indication of marriage. It is found in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 8. This is the Lord speaking concerning Israel or Jerusalem. And he said, Later I pass by, and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord, Sovereign Lord, and you became mine. The symbolic act of spreading the lower part of one's garment over another signified protection and betrothal. And in this passage, it speaks of the marriage between God and his people. It speaks of a marriage covenant. And so Ruth is asking Boaz to marry her. We may ask, why didn't Ruth wait for Boaz to propose to her? His statement in chapter 3 verse 10 suggests the first reason. Boaz twice refers to Ruth as my daughter and blesses her for not choosing to marry a young man. Boaz was likely an older man and Ruth a young woman and he fully expected her to marry one of the young bachelors in Bethlehem. And so he considered ah, she wouldn't want me. But the most important reason is given in verse 12 where Boaz says there was a nearer kinsman in town who had first option on Ruth and the property. And Boaz was waiting for him to act. But since Ruth has forced the issue here, Boaz will now approach his kinsman and get him to decide. Naomi took a risk. Ruth took a risk. Faith is risky. It is a step into the unknown. It is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But faith requires us to be bold and courageous to step out in faith. We cannot walk on water if we refuse to step out of the boat. God may not be calling you to a dangerous battle or a life-threatening situation, but eventually we will all face situations where we have to step out of our comfort zones. At some point, if we are acting in courageous faith, we may experience even ridicule or scorn. And if you continue to follow God in obedience, sometimes your social standing or maybe even your financial standing is threatened. Will you follow God's plans when your friends and your family refuse their support? 
only courageous faith will keep us going when we are puzzled by the circumstances, when we are suffering for our choices, or when we are going through the valley. The strongest courage that we can possibly experience comes from faith in an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God. Courageous faith is confident that God cannot and will not make a mistake, that God cannot be wrong, that God can never be defeated. We find courage when we trust in His power, in His character, in His promises and in His word. All that means is we have to trust God because faith shows itself in trust. Following God's plan will not always be easy, but we can trust that our all-powerful, all-loving God will continue to equip us and guide us and strengthen us in our battles. We must always trust in this good and holy God, our loving Father, who will never make a mistake. In our story, Ruth trusted Naomi, even though it was such a risky and dangerous plan. Note her reply to Naomi's suggestion. Ruth said, I will do whatever you say. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. She obeyed. She did what her mother-in-law told her to do because she trusted Naomi. Boaz could have easily misunderstood Ruth's intentions. If he's the wrong kind of man, he could have taken advantage of her. And if word had gotten out of what she had done, her reputation could have been tarnished. At the very least, he could have rejected her. It's surely very risky. But Naomi trusted Boaz. She knew that Boaz was a godly man of integrity. She knew that Boaz favoured Ruth. And so she arranged for Ruth to ask Boaz to marry her in the most dignified and discreet way possible. God's plans may not always make sense to us. God himself says, My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. But if God is truly speaking, then we must follow in obedience. We must follow in obedience like what Joshua did, marching around the, the city of Jericho, hearing the ridicule from the people. We must do what Gideon did, marching into battle with only 300 men and looking down at the valley, looking at the Midianite army that spread out in the valley as thick as locusts. We follow. We follow. They courageously followed through God's plans, both Joshua and Gideon, because they knew the enormity of God's power and trusted that he would follow through on his promises. They knew that if God commanded them to act in battle, then God had a plan for victory. And we must keep up that steadfastness and constancy of faith that regardless of what the enemy is bringing up, we can safely say, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. He is able, God is able, and we can trust him. We can trust him. And last but certainly not least, even as we trust in God, faith shows itself in patience. Boaz was ready to carry out Ruth's wish as soon as circumstances would legally allow it. And he made her a solemn promise. He told her to stay the night and in the morning when she left, he provided her with a generous gift of six eight parts of barley before she left. Naomi at home was waiting eagerly to hear how things went. When Ruth explained all that had happened, Naomi said, Wait, wait my daughter until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Wait, wait, wait. Most of us hate waiting and don't do it well. In this day and age, we expect things to be instantaneous. We want our, cook, our food to be cooked fast. We want our computers to be fast. We want, and when we want uh, information, we want it at the of our 
hands in seconds in minutes and all this makes waiting one of the most difficult and frustrating things we have to do we have to deny our impulse to act and simply be still in the presence of God waiting for his timing now note there is no contradiction between faith showing itself in action and faith showing itself in patience as Ecclesiastes tells us there is a time and season for everything there is a time for faith to act and there is a time for faith to wait Ruth and Naomi had acted now they have to wait there's a sense of peace in the waiting because they know that God is working on their behalf if your faith will ever become a winning faith it needs patience to see its outcome Hebrews 6 12 says we imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised Abraham and Sarah were not perfect in their faith and patience towards God had they been fully trusting and patient Hagar would not have born Ishmael we would not have so much problems in the Middle East but nevertheless the faith and patience of Sarah and Abraham is a great example for us God in his due time gave them a son Isaac now patience is used in two ways in the Bible it is used as a time period we always need patience in the passage of a certain time frame for the manifestation of our faith and the more we trust and believe in someone the more patient we are for example if you have a friend and your friend promised to meet you but he he makes you wait hey it doesn't matter because you know that friend is trustworthy he's reliable he he means what he says but we would not be so patient if it is someone that we do not trust and the second place where patience is used is second way is in a crisis situation when your faith is being tested patience is that inner quietness that peace that quietness that serenity that keeps your faith constant knowing that God never fails it is this patience that breeds perseverance and endurance so patience comes forth in two ways in the time period and also in the crisis situation now Naomi and Ruth, Ruth had done what they could do and the next step was out of their hands they had to wait for Boaz who Naomi says will not rest until the matter is settled today and I like to speak to you and ask you is there something that you're waiting on God for you've done your part and now it is out of your hands there is an act of waiting that is as much a part of faith and hope as acting and risking it is time to wait and trust in God today we need faith more than ever in the face of uncertain days faith is the space between God's promise and its fulfillment Joshua 21 verse 45 says not one of all the Lord's good promises to the house of Israel failed everyone was fulfilled if God has made you a promise he will fulfill it God always finishes his work and God will not rest until that work is done therefore if God is at work we can be at rest in him Hebrews 11 1 says now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen faith arising from hope shows itself in firstly action are you doing something about what you have been hoping and praying for the Bible tells us to ask and then when we ask we need to seek and when we seek we will find and when we know it will be open maybe there's something that God is asking you to do or there's something that you need to come out and and step forth with courage 
to be bold and courageous because faith arising from hope shows itself in courage. We, maybe God is asking you to step into the waters, whether it is crossing the Jordan or walking towards Jesus. Hey, that is God asking you to step out of your comfort zone. Will you be courageous to do that? After all, He has promised to be with you, to never leave you, nor forsake you. Faith arising from hope shows itself in trust. Whatever He says to you, do it. Like Joshua, marching around the walls of Jericho. Like Gideon, going into, into battle, facing a mighty army with his 300. Hey, trust in God. Whatever He says to you, do it because He is able to take you through. He is able to give you that victory. And lastly, faith arising from hope gives us patience, shows itself in patience. When you have done all that you can do, wait. And that is the true testing of your faith. So let faith arise. Now is not the time to give up. You will never know how close you are to your breakthrough. And it could be just round the corner. God is always up to good. We always say someone is up to no good. But with God, He's always up to good. Up to good in your life, in my life. And He's worthy of our confidence and hope. If our faith is in a faithful God, and our eyes are fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, we can know without a shadow of a doubt that we will be strengthened with the power of His Spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our, in our hearts through faith. Let us pray. Father, we just bring before you each and every one of us, my brothers and my sisters. Lord, whatever situation we are in, Father, we look to you and you alone, O God. We know without a shadow of a doubt, you are a faithful God. And by faith, we fix our eyes upon Jesus because we know it's from Him, the author and the finisher of our faith, that we are going to draw strength. And that, Lord Jesus, you are going to see us through every circumstance. And Father, we ask, O oh God, for the power of your Holy Spirit to reside in us so that, Lord, you will cause faith to arise, faith to believe in you, faith to take that step of faith, to walk in, in that courageous way, to be able to step out of our comfort zone, to walk on water. And most of all, Lord, we ask, O oh God, that Lord, in every circumstance, that Lord, you come true for us, that Lord, we will experience and know all that we have heard, all that we have read in the Bible, how true, how wonderful, how marvelous our, our loving Father, our miracle-working God is. So Father, I entrust my brothers and sisters into your hands. I entrust all of us into your hands, O oh God. And Lord, we declare in the name of Jesus that Lord, you will cause faith to arise arise within us that lord we will be mighty men and women of faith walking by faith in you and unto the glory and and um, honor of god and in all things i bless my brothers and sisters i thank you in jesus name we pray amen amen god bless you have a lovely week in the lord